USS Enterprise, America's Big E. We'll take you aboard this massive warship for a first-hand look at the people who make her work. We'll watch the dangerous dance of man and machine on the flight deck. We'll climb into the cockpit to learn what it's like to blast off the ship. And we'll ride the Big E through one of the world's narrowest and most historic waterways. All as we give you a slice of life on the Big E. Hi, I'm Michael Jordan, and I'm going to introduce you to the people of the USS Enterprise, the Big E, America's first and finest nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. You know, the Enterprise is a fascinating ship, but the really interesting stories are about the people who make her work. Nobody works harder than the people on the flight deck. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen it, the flight deck of an aircraft carrier never ceases to amaze you. Amid the noise of countless roaring jet engines, dozens of young men and women in brightly colored jerseys, helmets, and goggles seem to follow the steps of a secret but well-rehearsed dance. They wave their arms like robots, giving signals to pilots in their planes. Steam explodes from hidden places down below, and mighty warplanes thunder past just inches away. Many decks above the action, the air boss runs the show. It's honestly, it's like it's like ballet, and as long as everyone shows up, does what they're supposed to do, like I said, it's it's the most incredible show on earth. Steam from the ship's reactors, transmitted to four powerful catapults, provides the push needed to fire the planes off the ship. The pilots just hang on for dear life. It's pretty intense. It's uh, zero to about 160 miles an hour in uh, under two seconds. I mean, the cat shot is, is just insane. Think about the most tremendous uh, roller coaster that you've ever been on. You know, just the amount of acceleration, it just throws you back in your seat and uh, you know, you just grunt to, to keep yourself there, and it's absolutely awesome. Landing is a different matter. If the pilots do it right, a tail hook on the end of the plane snags a heavy steel arresting cable that brings the plane to a sudden stop. If not, they roar off the front of the ship and come around for another try. And that's just what it's like in the daytime. At night, the only light comes from the glowing wands in the hands of the plane crews and the flames searing out the back of the jets all in a day and a night's work on the deck of the Big E. No doubt about it, the flight deck is an amazing place, but wait until you see what the Enterprise is like below decks. Sometimes it's real uh, close quarters because you have roughly 5,500 people that you live with every day and you can't escape, you can't get in the car and drive around the block or go to the grocery stores. The sailors and marines are certainly not the only ones enduring sacrifices to get the job done. They could not do it without the support of their spouses and loved ones back at home, sharing in six months of separation during the Big E's deployment. You know I love you and I miss you and I'm ready for you to be home. We'll find out how one Big E couple bridges thousands of miles to stay in touch and bear each other up when life on the Big E comes back right after this. There you go. Welcome back to Life on the Big E. I'm Michael Jordan, and this summer I spent more than a week in the Middle East with local troops serving on the USS Enterprise, the Big E. The Enterprise is a very historic ship. She's America's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, commissioned in November of 1961. She's got the longest flight deck of any carrier in the world, more than a thousand feet long, and covering four and a half acres. And she's America's fastest big ship, slicing through the sea at more than 30 knots. That's close to 30 miles per hour. This is the, uh, this is the old lady of the sea, as, as they affectionately call it. It's a class by itself. Later in the show, we'll go along for a history-making ride on this historic ship. Let's leave the flight deck now and climb down below decks, where the Enterprise 5,000 sailors and Marines live and work for six months. Now, the Enterprise might be a big ship, but these young men and women live in anything but luxury. There's no getting around the fact that the Enterprise is an old ship. She's crowded, cramped, and sometimes cluttered. Every morning at 7.30 on the nose, the entire ship's crew goes to cleaning stations, scrubbing the ship from bow to stern. But it seems like the work is never done. 
And since the ship uses the 95 degree Persian Gulf water to cool its air conditioning system, temperatures in many parts of the ship below decks can soar above 100 degrees. And what do y'all think about the heat on the ship? It's it sucks. sucks. Yeah, it's very hot. It's real hot. It's, uh, some spaces get up to 120, most spaces around 80 or above. Imagine spending six solid months sweating in a factory, eating, working, and even sleeping with the same 5,000 people every day, and you'll have a little bit of an idea what it's like. I wish they could uh, get a, a chance to experience this. It's, it's like a floating city. Everybody always wonders what the aircraft carrier is like to live on. It's, sometimes it's real cl uh, close quarters because you have roughly 5,500 people that you live with every day, and you can't escape. You can't get in the car and drive around the block or go to the grocery store. So. Sometimes, you know, it can be hectic, but it's, a, it's definitely an experience. Many of the ship's enlisted personnel sleep in spaces crammed with dozens of bunks. Their only storage space is a small drawer underneath their bed. It's a basically a cot, like a coffin. You open it up and you have compartments you store your clothes in. You lay it back down. It's a mattress about a couple of inches thick, two or three inches thick. Sailors have to stand in line for everything, including the 50 cents per minute satellite payphones they use to call home. To unwind, they play video games, card games, <laughs> dominoes. <laughs> but the one place where they can drop their guard, lower the barriers between officers and enlisted sailors, and just be themselves is church. It's nice to just kind of sit down and pray and feel, feel like I'm back at home, if you will. Well, I think for me it's, uh, it's a great relief. Uh, it's an opportunity to kind of center myself and sort of uh, collect my thoughts and put everything in perspective. It's a connection to home uh, and it allows, it allows me to, uh, uh, like I said, think about my family in a positive way and, and know that the sacrifices and the things that we're doing out here uh, aren't for naught. The strong family connections were obvious as the Marines of VMFA 251 said farewell to their families at the Marine Corps Air Station in Beaufort, South Carolina back in May. One last hug and a kiss and it's time to climb aboard a plane for the flight to the Enterprise. Definitely a painful goodbye, but families say it's important to be there. I couldn't stand not to come and see him off and spend every single minute that we could possibly get together before they have to go. Seeing the love those families had for their troops, we decided to help one of the Marines' wives make a special connection with her husband aboard the Enterprise. Holly Norris has no trouble at all describing her husband, Gunnery Sergeant Damian Norris. He's a Marine, um, to the true definition of the word. Um, he's wonderful. He is a wonderful father. He loves toys, you know, big boy toys, motorcycles, boats, anything like that, sports. This is Damien and Holly's first long-term deployment since they married four years ago, and the first since they had their two-year-old son, Joseph. It's tough, but Holly remains supportive across the miles. He's doing what he loves to do. Um, he has always said he didn't join the military to sit on the sidelines, so this is what his true calling is. So. During my visit aboard Enterprise, I took the videotape of Holly and two-year-old Joseph to show Damien on the ship. He used to have a, a plastic bat, but then his brother gave him his old t-ball bat, so... Where's Daddy? Where's Daddy? As little Joseph plays with his toy aircraft carrier in North Carolina, his dad's work takes him all over the real ship in the Middle East. But Joseph and Holly are never far from Damien's thoughts. She's a strong person, um, and you know, I'm sure she'll do a great job as, with everything else she does. So I have no worries about it. About it. Or raising Joseph. And what message do the Norrises have for each other? <laughs> you know I love you and I miss you and I'm ready for you to be home as soon as you can be. I know it's not going to be soon, but that I'm ready to be back as a family, be back with you. And you know, I support you in everything that you do, so don't buy a car. <laughs> no motorcycles, no boats. Um, I didn't buy anything. You have no motorcycle um, or car or anything like that. I love you, I miss you, I can't wait to be back with you, with you and Joseph so we can do all the, um, the things that you know, we usually do together and all, but, but I love you. From family connections to dangerous missions over enemy territory, we've got it all. Go flying with American pilots headed into combat when life on the Big E continues right after this.
Welcome back to Life on the Big E. I'm Michael Jordan, and during my visit on the USS Enterprise this summer, I got a chance to spend some time with the pilots who fly these F-18 Hornets. So join me now for a behind-the-scenes look at these real-life top guns. Standard uh, CV pre-flight struts, tires, hook, uh, AOA, and make sure your ailerons are fared. Meet Lothar and Doobie. Not their real names, mind you, but their call signs. Lothar is actually Captain Joe Yaskovich, and Doobie is Captain Brad Dubinsky. Before they climb into their F-18 Hornets and fly off the carrier, the pilots make sure they have their game plan down pat. You know, we, we do a lot of horsing around and stuff on our free time, but when it's time to be professional, we're professional. Uh, it's kind of a focus thing, because before the brief, you're getting everything together, all your bricks, all the information you need. It's kind of hectic, and once the brief starts, kind of focus all your efforts and uh, what you're going to go do. After the one-hour briefing, the pilots take a short walk down the passageway to a small chamber where they suit up for the flight. Then a quick pre-flight check of the aircraft, followed by a conversation with plane crews shouted over the noise of nearby aircraft, and the mission begins. This time, it's just target practice. But shortly, it'll be the real deal, dropping bombs to help American soldiers on the ground in Iraq. Lothar and Doobie's commanding officer says it's a natural job for his pilots. Uh, and in this environment, uh, it is very clear that we are supporting uh, the Marines on the ground, the soldiers on the ground. There is a big fight going on over there right now. Locked and loaded, the Marines streak off the Enterprise to go do what they do best. Those Hornet pilots will be flying daily missions with pilots from Jacksonville, Florida-based VS-32, the Maulers. And this deployment on the Enterprise is an especially meaningful one for the Mauler team. You're watching what will likely be one of the final few flights of the S-3B Viking. The venerable four-seat aircraft got its start back in the Cold War as a weapon to use against enemy submarines. Soon it will be mothballed and replaced with a new multi-role Super Hornet fighter, a tough pill to swallow for veteran Viking pilots like Commander John Brest. I'm uh, coming up on 20 years in the Navy and I've been in the S-3B the whole time. And it's a great airplane and it's, it's sad to see it go. Now that the threat has changed, so has the Vikings' mission. These days, it's used to scout out unknown ships steaming too close to the American aircraft carriers and to provide in-air refueling for other fighters in the air wing. Both roles are jobs the pilots of VS-32 seem to relish. It's a major, major deal. I mean, if we don't fly, no one flies. All those capabilities, we, we can see things that the ship, if, if it wasn't for us, they, they wouldn't be able to see. If the Maulers seem unusually sentimental on this deployment, it's with good reason. They fly without two of their most valuable team members. Lieutenant Commanders Todd Blake and Scott Branchard were both killed in a weather-related crash back in Jacksonville in September. And their colleagues still feel their loss. really wanted to have their memory with us. We always uh, make sure we keep a spot for them uh, in our hearts and in our minds at all times. And uh, we really uh, wanted to come out here for them and for their families. It's a reminder that even when you're doing everything right, this is a very dangerous job. Welcome back to Life on the Big E. There's no doubt about it, the folks you meet on the Enterprise are some of the most interesting you'll find anywhere. Take Commander Rick McCormick, for instance, the commanding officer of the Sidewinders, whose name is painted on this aircraft parked at the Marine Corps Air Station in Beaufort. During my time on the Enterprise, Commander McCormick celebrated his 40th birthday. And that same day, he took us on a behind-the-scenes tour of the Sidewinders' ready room. Every squadron on the Enterprise has a ready room. It's kind of a combination of clubhouse and workplace all in one. This ready room belongs to VMFA 251, the Thunderbolts from Beaufort, South Carolina. Here's the ready room for Chopper Squadron HS-11 from Jacksonville, Florida. And finally, the ready room for VFA-86, the Sidewinders, also from Beaufort, South Carolina. On the ship, its quarters are pretty tight. So this is the one place where we can all go to eat popcorn, uh, drink soda, and uh, watch movies, and uh, give each other a good ribbing. And, There's a lot uh, of personality in here. What yep. kind of things have you brought to make it unique to The biggest thing is a family calendar that we bring from home. Uh, that's updated every uh, month from the folks uh, back home, our families, friends. 
and each day someone will go ahead and put a picture in there. We have sponsors for the single guys so that they don't feel left out. If it's interesting people you're looking for in the enterprise, you needn't look farther than Sergeant Major Michael Gonzalez. Gonzalez grew up in a street gang in Los Angeles and chose the Marines as a teenager as an alternative to jail. Now, close to three decades later, Gonzalez says it was the smartest decision he's ever made. Uh, it gave me discipline, what I needed in boot camp. It gave me that, and, uh, and it, gave me, uh, it gave me something to live for. You know, I'm in the big gang in the Marine Corps, so the big green gang, so we take care of each other a lot better. Price is died. Price is risen. Chaplain Jeffrey Seiler got his start in the military and the Marines as well. He served as an enlisted Marine in Vietnam, then came home and joined the ministry years later. Now, later still, Siler is back among the troops. And when I was in the parish, I found myself around mainly churched people uh, and not really being able to reach out to anybody on the outside. But being in the, uh, in the Navy, uh, on board a ship, or when I've been serving with the Marines. Okay, you see a Marine out of Buf uh, Buford. Yes, sir. Okay, good. People will come to me that would never darken the door of a church. They would never talk to a clergy person at all. And oftentimes they come to me just because I'm available. And so uh, it's an opportunity to be able to talk with them, to help them perhaps through a crisis that they're going through. Should they need help in a crisis, two Enterprise sailors can lean on a very surprising support system. They're brothers. Christopher and Patrick Carrington are both members of VS-32, and both were promoted to Petty Officer 3rd Class aboard the Enterprise on the same day. Yeah, I'm happy to see my brother finally put it on for one, and I, I, I'm still thinking, who put that there, sir? <laughs> who put that there? I'm just happy, for one, to be stationed with my brother, and uh, for two, that we were able to make rank at the same time, because I don't know what I would have done if my little brother had made rank before me. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Final, so all in the two thirds, five, six RPM, and can there's a lot more to come. We'll ride the Big E through one of the world's most historic waterways when life on the Big E continues right after this. Welcome back to Life on the Big E, the USS Enterprise. More than 5,000 sailors and Marines from our area are calling the Big E home for six months. Their crews carried them across the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, but nothing could prepare the crew for what they experienced on May 29th when the Enterprise entered the Suez Canal. Completed back in 1869, this narrow ribbon of dark water stretches 100 miles from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. Dozens of ships make the passage each day, and on this day, America's mighty Enterprise is one of them. On one side, Egyptian cities and towns dot the green coastline. On the other, the bleak moonscape of the Sinai Peninsula stretches as far as the eye can see. The land where Moses is said to have received the Ten Commandments and where many modern-day wars have claimed countless lives. Egyptian military patrol boats zip around beneath the massive carrier and a truckload of soldiers rolls alongside. Signs written in Arabic and English read, Welcome to Egypt. On the bridge, Captain Lawrence Rice is calm but not too relaxed. Egyptian security has done a great job out there, but you just never know who's going to pop up behind a sand dune or one of the buildings that we're passing by. Taking no chances, Captain Rice has stationed armed sailors around the edges of the ship just in case. Landing gear, cockpit canopies, and other parts of the Enterprise's air wing are shrouded in foil to protect them from the abrasive sand borne on the wind. And the now inactive flight deck is crowded with sailors and Marines taking snapshots of this once-in-a-lifetime sight. I wanted to see something amazing that, uh, that I might not ever see again in life. Because you got the, the guards, the Arabic cops, whatever you want to call them, armed up as you're going past with, the, with their guns, you know. Their AKs and their MAC-10s or their 12 gauges or whatever. You know, when you think about it, Suez, the historical events that have happened here, most of the crew wasn't even alive uh, when the number of wars that went on around here. And the only thing they know about Suez is what they read in the history books. There is at least one person aboard the ship who's been here before. Lieutenant Franklin Hunt was aboard Enterprise 20 years ago when she became the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in history to pass through the Suez Canal. Now, if you know where to look, there are still reminders of that first passage so long ago. 20 years ago, it was an electrical shop. Very, very so faintly, you see the AE-3 Hunt written in the panel from a our cruise from January to August of 86. 
While they may not leave their own graffiti written below decks, without a doubt, these young sailors following in Hunt's footsteps will never forget the amazing sights they're seeing today. When they finished the journey through the Suez Canal, the Enterprise and her crew left friendly waters and joined the day-to-day -day fight to support our troops on the ground in Iraq. I'd like to say thank you to them and their families for all the sacrifices they make for our freedom. And thank you for joining us for this look at life on the Big E. In July 2006, the USS Enterprise and her air wing concluded their mission in the Middle East and moved into the Western Pacific, where American interests are always threatened by various nations and terrorist groups. Since arriving in the Persian Gulf on June 6, the Enterprise launched more than 1,000 sorties and amassed more than 4,000 flight hours supporting American and Allied troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. 